Judges chapter 6. I may ask, is, well, don't want to be imposing, but if there's a cup of water or a bottle of water, you can just dip it out of the fish tank. I'd even be happy with that. <laughs> Not that uh, this last, or it was a week ago, my, I grew up in Iowa on a dead end road to the Mississippi River, and my dad has a boat, so he has everything ready, and that's my dad been longing to see his grandkids. Even me every once in a while. And he said, I got the boat ready. And Ethan went, took him out fishing a few, about a month ago. It's not exactly go fishing. Okay, my dad has the truck boat all hooked up, ready to go, motor ready to go, because he knew we're coming back. So it's, and it's a mile to the Mississippi River. And we caught fish, but yeah, fish water does not taste good. But if he does bring it, I'll drink it. <laughs> if I get thirsty enough, desperate. Ooh, ooh, real bottled water. Thank you. Mm. I forgot that's right. <laughs> if you all are not saying amen enough to my bad jokes, <laughs> mediocre preaching, and whatever other story happens to fall out, I'm going to pick up this bottle of water because you have a great, great pastor and great custom. Mm. There we go. That'll be the last compliment of the night for Pastor Wagon. <laughs> oh, we were reminiscing today. Uh-oh, still not getting to the scripture. About the first time I got to be with the Wagon Shoots whole clan. I was in a singing group and pastor's nephew was, we sang together with him and we went to Grandpa Wagon Shoot's house and I learned very quickly, like I said this afternoon, keep your mouth shut or else you're going to get whacked <laughs> verbally or maybe physically too. <laughs> Depends if you insult. Now, they will, they'll go after the Wagon Shoot's women, but if some outsider says some snide or off the wall comment about one of the wagon shoots women yeah you are going to get hit so buy one of them but anyway (laughs) it was a very wonderful memory and i just sat and i was there for the comments before that even existed in 2001 but uh amen (laughs) judges chapter 6 verse 16 judges 6 16 tonight i'm going to talk about gideon and the idea of this is what following God can do. From a missionary's perspective, as I'm a missionary, but we all, the idea I have is that we can apply what is said here tonight from the scripture, that we all can apply it to our lives. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to be a pastor or assistant pastor called to be a Sunday school teacher or uh, anybody can be called to be a Sunday school teacher, amen? That's just surrender your life and to do what God has you to do. Uh, you send your life and say, ah, there's some folks I don't like public speaking. Why? Because there's the two greatest fears in life or death and public speaking. So if I die here, that's about the worst combination you could ever have. <laughs> but uh, and some folks, they're not going to get in front of people and talk. That's just how it is. And, uh, but they can assemble, fix, clean, help. And, but you can be surprised what following God can do. And Gideon is an example of somebody that was just doing farming work in a country that had been taken over by an enemy. And God used him in a way that really was surprising to even himself. I don't believe Gideon was surprised every single step of the way what the Lord was doing with him. And there may be somebody here tonight, maybe might direct a little more towards, there might be somebody here tonight, possibly, that God in the future may ask to do something special, may ask to do something farther or above and beyond or beyond what you're already doing. I don't know that. I'm not omnipotent. I'm not, I'm not omniscient. And I'm a Bears fan, so I guess that really takes a whole lot of credit out of anything I ever say. So, yeah, there is my brother-in-law right before he came. He had a great joke. He said, hey, did you hear that there's massive storms going through Illinois? Yeah, it was a whole bunch of tornadoes. You know where they went and told everybody to go for shelter? Soldier Field. Never see a touchdown there. But uh, (laughs) after the last few seasons, what am I supposed to say? I can't even name the coach. (laughs) Uh, But I'm a Cubs fan, too, which has taught me to endure to the end. And 2016 will come. But Gideon here, God used him when he wasn't expecting to be used. And let's go to Judges chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. 
<clears throat> to start, and then I'll pray. But let's read this first part here. Judges 6, 12 through 16, says here, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Verse 13, chapter 6. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? They were captives. They were under the Midianites. They were suffering. They had all their food taken about once a year. They did not live an easy life. Continuing on. And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us unto the hands of the Midianites? And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And the idea for tonight is what following God can do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, I ask you, bless this time as we spend it in your word and bless the preaching. Help us, Lord, to see that you can use anyone. You want to use everyone. And Lord, I pray that you would guide as I preach and guide as I say what needs to be said. Lord, help me to say what would be edifying to the folks and helping them to also find that calling and the choices in their life that they need to make. Bless this time of preaching. Now I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Gideon, at this point in his life, the Midianites had come. They had been in charge. I forgot how many years they had been in charge. It says at the beginning of the chapter, but it has slipped my mind. Seven years. So seven years they had been under bondage, and it was not an easy bondage. They came, like it says, as grasshoppers. They came and they took everything. And uh, so here was Gideon. He was uh, in the, it was the, they call it lagar in Spanish. What do we call it? Not the threshing floor. It was a place where you basically, it's an underground basement. Once again, wine press. There we go, wine press. That is the word. Why was it coming in Spanish? Because I have taught this about eight months ago. I didn't, not this, but it was just teaching through the book of Judges. But uh, that's why the word came to me in Spanish. Didn't know it was in English. That might happen once in a while. But he was there in the wine press, which is underground, hidden. And in the wine press, apparently they had come and taken everything. They didn't have any grapes at that point. So he was threshing wheat. He was using that to provide food for his family. And in comes an angel while he's hiding, while he's trying to do everything under the noses of the enemy, essentially. And here comes the angel. It also talks about, it says, angel of the Lord. And then it also says, oh, my Lord. And it says, and the Lord said unto him. So you may, it may have been an angel. It may have been Jesus Christ himself that came down to talk to him. It, when you look at it, it kind of gives one or both the ideas. But either or, the angel of the Lord or Lord Jesus Christ coming to talk to him, it was somebody sent from God that came to talk to Gideon to give him, the first point I have here is, he called him. And that's, Gideon was trying to do what he could. And it's interesting, man of valor, courageous man. <laughs> Very interesting how he comes. Lord said unto him, the Lord is with thee, mighty man of valor. I'm hiding underneath of the ground from the enemy trying to grind wheat, thresh, thresh wheat, and then make food for my family so nobody sees me. Where's the man of courage? Where, where's, I, I don't see him. You, you are that man. Me, there's no way on top of that. And he starts arguing with it. It's an angel. If it was not Jesus, it was an angel. He starts arguing with him. I think we do the same thing because we're Baptists, Amen. <laughs> like we'd have an angel show up and they'd say this is a great church great church where have you been don't you know our problems and our issues and everything else oh how could you say that and the lord be like well i just tried to give you a compliment you know but <laughs> boy sometimes we're divisive and that's what gideon was a little bit he was a little bit could you imagine why he might have a little bit of anger he couldn't do even easy normal things in front of everybody he had to hide he had to live a hidden life as you've Heard stories of missionaries that to this day, God calls them to an area. If you go to Cuba, you have to serve the Lord hidden. If you go to Russia, probably today also, or in China, you can't have an open church. But God has called missionaries to places in this world 
where it's not easy. And God called Gideon in a place that was not an easy place to live. And he, he called him and he said, you got the wrong guy. On top of that, why are you allowing all these things? Haven't you heard the stories of how God did all this for our nation? And now look where we're at. It just doesn't make sense. It's not fair. It's not right. But it is interesting that the angel didn't address that. He just went back to him and said, I still want to use you. I see something in you that nobody else, including yourself, even sees. That's kind of what I see in Gideon here. I don't see a... In all the story, I don't see a man, and it is reinforced later on in the story, I don't see Gideon as a proud man, not like Saul, who pretended to be humble and was never humble at all the whole time. He was just a proud man pretending to be humble. More like David, who was humble that made errors and made mistakes and learned along the way. That is an important distinction there. But I see Gideon as that, where he was truly baffled at God's call. And God may call, it's a possibility, God may call one of you here tonight to go to a place where you'd have, you'd think, not me, just talking this afternoon about Brother Prem, if I say his right name right. He's from here, right? He's, this is where he grew up. And God called him to a very hard place at this point. It's like one missionary that was in the Ukraine wrote a letter back a few years ago. Hey, I'm one of the few missionaries that I did not move and I changed fields. I'm now in Russia. Anyway, <laughs> that happened to one missionary that was in the Crimea. I could not imagine that being the case. I could if the Chileans ever marched over the mountains. The men, people in Mendoza would say, you finally came to rescue us. But that's a different topic. Hey, Yes. We actually have a thing in Mendoza. It's called the Mendo Exit. They want to leave Argentina. We're sick and tired of paying taxes and getting nothing. But <laughs> another interesting fact about where I live, and didn't pass. I'm sad. I voted to leave. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't. That's a joke. I don't vote down there because I'm a U.S. citizen. But uh, Gideon heard God's call, and God may call you. Even the place you wouldn't expect. Here he was in, in a basement hiding the angel showed up god knows where to find you god knew where to find him he found him there and said you are the man that i am going to use so then after that he had a choice to make god gave him a call gideon you're going to deliver the nation of israel <laughs> okay <laughs> i don't know how his response was and he did show him a sign a little bit later on where verse 20 the angel of god said unto him take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon the rock and Pour out the broth, and he did. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and unleavened cakes. And there rose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. So God did show him in verse 20 and 21 a sign that he was from God, gave him a miracle. He saw that, and he said, whoa, okay, you are from the Lord. You can make fire appear out of basically nothing out of the rock to consume the, the sacrifice. So then he had, after he was called, then he had a choice to make. Just like Paul on the road to Damascus. He had a choice? Yeah, when he made it up to Damascus, he could have said, Ah, I give up all this stuff. Ah, he saw a vision I can't see, and Ananias healed him. I'm going to go back. And Paul had a, or Saul had a choice. Gideon had a choice. We have a choice. We always do. And that choice, look here in verses 25 through 30. And this is where he had to make a choice. And Am I going to go forward with my calling? Or am I just going to go back and thresh wheat? Uh, hidden underneath in a wine press and do things as I've always done and just wait for the Midianites to show up next time and rob everything we have. Now you get used to it. You know, oppression is okay if it's state-sanctioned. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just keep on in that cycle and, and maybe, may, maybe somebody or Scott will do something. Or, yeah, but, you know, no, he had to make a choice. Verse 25 through 30, here was his first choice. Verse 25, chapter 6. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the, with the wood of the burnt, ah, wood of the grove, sorry, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men. He had to make a choice. God said, "I want you to do." This, not an easy thing, what he was telling him to do. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so, it, and, and so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day 
that he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And I think it's verse 31, just for extra, I think this is interesting. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be God, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down the altar, his altar. I always like that statement. Interesting. Joash, his own grove, his own place of an idol was cast down. It kind of woke him up too. <laughs> Thinking, wait, what am I doing? But here's the first thing. God went, called Gideon. Hey, Gideon, man of valor. Where? Who? Me? Yes, you. Now, as a sign, I'm going to bring fire out of a rock. Oh, all right. Okay, I'm ready for the next step. God steps in. Next step, I want you to, you see that Grove, and in Argentina, it's very easy to understand this because in every single park, there is a little sanctuary for Mary. Every single little park. Along the road, there's sanctuaries to a woman that died trying to take water to her husband. They called her the, uh, the dead lady Correa. That's what they call her. That, uh, that she was trying to get to her husband in the army taking water, and she died in the desert trying to get there. So alongside the road, you see these sanctuaries built up with stickers and with all their with coins and things dedicated to this lady that died it's a it's like a grove in argentina you get to see them all over the place to san expedito Ex, uh, expedito expedito i can't say it in english i don't know what he did but he's another saint but uh, you'll see these things set up and they're all over the place now could you imagine going in front of somebody's catholic house here where they have mary inside the upside down bathtub and you going to that house I grew up in a Catholic town. They were all over the place. Dubuque was 80% Catholic when I was growing up where I grew up. Going there, kicking down Mary, busting the bathtub up, and then on top of that, killing a bull, letting the blood out all over the place, and burning it up in front of their house. Now do you understand why they were mad? On top of that, it was a park. It was a beautiful place. This altar was not, they call it grove or whatnot. It would have been more in a park type setting if i'm not mistaken so now instead of front of somebody's house imagine the beautiful park here there's a statue to whoever crossed lake superior first and you have the thing there and god says kick down his bronze statue sacrifice a cow on top of that thing let the blood spill all over and burn it all you think the city fathers might be after you tomorrow who did this we're gonna find them we're gonna find their kids and we're gonna find all their relatives <laughs> they'd be a little bit mad wouldn't they well that's why do you think they're mad they come out who did this? Gideon, kill him! Look what he did to our beautiful park. Look what he did to our grotto. He destroyed it. But God first called him, and then he had to make a choice. Am I going to serve God? Okay, well, if you're going to serve God, you're going to have to get rid of the idolatry that's in your family. You're going to have to get rid of that thing that's in your life that is going to keep you from serving the Lord. And apparently the thing that was in the life of Gideon that was going to keep him from serving the Lord must have been before he went out to battle, before he went out and put out the, uh, the fleece that was going to be wet or dry, before all that, God said, I think it's important that you knock down your family's idol, that you destroy the idolatry in your family before you take the next step. That's what I deem important. I've called you, and now you have a choice. And he said, well, and Gideon always acts by night. If you look in the story, Gideon never does anything in the daytime. Almost nothing. When does he go to battle? At night. When does he chase the people after? When does he attack the city? That after they win, they keep on going. And when they, at night, Gideon was a night fighter. He loved to work in the dark. Where do we find, he was. Where do we find Gideon when we find him threshing? In a basement in the dark. Gideon, I don't know, he must have, God must have given him night vision goggles or something. Because that's, every time you look at Gideon, what's he doing? God, it's daytime. I ain't doing nothing. He must have worked third shift. Amen. <laughs> that was Gideon. Now you'll remember that for the rest. You'll start reading through the story and you're going to say, Brother Matt's crazy, but he's right. Gideon never did anything during the daytime. But and once again, you see here, he said, I'm afraid to do it during the day. Let's do it during the nighttime. Okay, well, let's do it during the nighttime. And he did that. And I think in my own life, not that I'm anything special or anything like that, but any preacher can say when God 
God called me when I was just 12 years old. I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew what I knew a sixth grader might know, which is not much. <laughs> but God called me to serve him, and God showed me where he wanted to go. I had to make some choices. I had to make a choice not to stay in the family farm and work there with my dad, but to go to Bible college. I had to make a choice to where, where to serve the Lord. I had to make a choice of who I was going to start dating, amen? Because if you're going to go to the mission field and be a pastor, you're going to get married. Lord willing, you're going to marry. And if you're going to marry somebody, you better be up front. God's called me to a place that's a long ways away. And that's one of our first conversations Heather and I had. She was okay with that. She's still okay with it today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> she's okay with the idea. Whether she's okay with me or not, sometimes that's, that's the great question. Amen. <laughs> but God calls, and then we have a choice. In my life, in my teen years, I had a choice. What steps am I going to take? Am I going to, I went to public school. I didn't go to a Christian school. Am I going to associate with people that are going to drag me down a wrong road? My public school is 1,600 people. Believe me, there was plenty of wrong roads to go down. <laughs> oh, there was plenty of wrong roads. I lived in a place called Cheryl outside of Dubuque. Cheryl was known as the place where you go at the weekend and have, get a lot of beer and teenagers go and do bad things. That's where I grew up. I told somebody about my junior, senior year. Where do you live? Cheryl, on a farm. Oh, we're going to go out there and have some beer. I'm like, I don't drink. What? The guy was surprised when I said, no, I don't drink. You live in Cheryl and you don't drink? Because everybody in my little town of 140 and around there, that's what we did. But I had to make a choice. Am I going to go down that path? Right. It would have been easy. I had a choice whether I decide to go to a public university and study whatever it was I was going to study. Just like anybody that's been a pastor. I think of uh, my parents' pastor for years, Pastor Larry Stark. He is up with the Lord in heaven. God called him when he was training to be, I believe, an architect or an engineer. And after his second year, he had to change and start going to Bible college. And that changed the lives of many because he decided, well, this is what I want, but this Amen. is what God's direction and his choice back in the 1960s, and there's been thousands and thousands of people that are going to be in heaven with him because he made a choice. And I think there's a lot of pastors we could talk about that have done that. But he gave Gideon, here's your call, here's your choice. Okay, let's go, tear it down. This is not easy. It almost cost him his life. Would we follow God if we thought it might cost us our life? That's a little bit of a rhetorical question, but something to think about. But God gave him that. God does this for missionaries, for pastors, and God can do this for you. Just like he did with Gideon. What was extra special about Gideon? Not really anything extraordinary. But he knew how to follow God. And what following God can do? Well, first he called him. Then he made a difficult choice. His dad stood up for him, thankfully. And then there's going to be challenges after we make that choice. There's going to be challenges in chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, he had to, once God tested him through taking down the altar, after he called him, he made that choice, I'm going to serve the Lord this consciously. I'm going to continue going on this. I'm seeing that God is with me. God is by my side. Now my family's on my side. All right, well, let's see if the whole nation's on my side. Now we're going to see that the nation of Israel is similar to a Baptist church. All right, let's get to work. Yay, everybody shows up for the work day. Well, let's see what happens when everybody shows up for the work day. All right. <laughs> Judges chapter 7, verse 1. Now God put some challenges in his path. The job was already going to be difficult enough. There was over 120,000 Midianites standing not too far away that he's going to have to battle against. All right, so here we go. Judges 7, 1. He's been called. He's made a choice. And how I'm going to do it? Verse 1. Then uh, Jerubal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and, and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now, Gideon was used to maybe being torpedoed by his own family because they'd been you know, idol worshippers. Now he's getting torpedoed by God saying, there's too many. What? You can never have too many. What military strategist do you ever think of? We're going to go into battle, we're going to fight, and we're going to go with the fewest amount of people possible. 
so we can say America. <laughs> That's not exactly how it works. We want more missiles, more boats, more people, more tanks, more of everything. Because that's how you win, usually. But with God, he had a different strategy. Okay, all right. I saw fire from a rock. Didn't die after I threw down the idols of my parents. All right, God, let's, let's go. Verse 3. Now, therefore, go, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, that there remained 10,000. There's going to be challenges on the way. I would imagine in Gideon's mind it played out more like this. Where Gideon, okay, uh, too many God, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll tell this to them. You want me, if they're afraid, tell them to go home and, you know, watch the view. All right, we'll do that. Okay, so <laughs> that was horrible, but now some of you are paying attention, don't know where that came out from. But, so, okay, I, I'll tell them, God. All right, if any of you, and in his mind, I imagine he'd say this, God doesn't want anybody to go home. All right, just, maybe there'll be a few weak, few that are, don't feel well, that got, you know, China flu. Maybe they'll, they're afraid of that, and they'll go home. And, all right, so, all right, whoever's afraid, and it's, oh, there's only going to be a handful leave. Whoever's afraid, doesn't want to die, doesn't want to fight those 100 and some odd thousand over there. God's with us. Remember, God's with us. Uh, just head on back home. It's all right. You'll be okay. And over half just turned around and marched away. God, that was not how I saw that turning out. Why'd they leave? They're afraid. Duh! <laughs> no, frustration. As thousands marched out to go home and do whatever they were going to do. Gideon's standing there. Well, hope God knows what he's doing. We can go at 10,000. I hope. God says, well, okay, all right, that, that's not how I envisioned that, but okay, let's, God's called me, I've made a choice, I'm in this, I'm invested, we're going to go. I put that fleece out there, we saw that fleece, the fleece was wet, the fleece was dry, obviously God is with us. I showed that to the people to show them that God is God, and that happened in the end of Judges chapter 6, apparently these 10,000, okay, and the Lord said in verse 4, and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many, I ain't telling them. Put yourself in Gideon's place or put yourself in a pastor's place where God says, you're a southerner, I want you to go up north. You're a northerner, go down south. You're from California. I want you to go to Texas. Ooh, yep, that, that's tough. <laughs> or I want you to go to Mexico. But Lord, isn't there, no, that, this is what I want you to do. It, these are hard things. God calls us, we make a choice. Gideon made a choice. Right. And now God is putting challenges. Think, ah, Okay, it's a challenge, but I don't have the money. I don't have a job. I don't know anybody that's there. Uh, how are we going to do this? And I guess that ran through my mind when I was in Bible college and after preparing to go to the field. When I get there, how in the world am I going to do this? And the answer was one step at a time. Gideon's taking steps here. And, uh, well, it looks like he's taking steps backwards. But God had a plan. It says here in verse 4, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the, under the water, and I will try them, for, uh, try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Once again, I have a feeling Gideon might have envisioned that 10 or 20 people were going to go home. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. 300. But God, you called me. I made a choice. Why are you giving me this challenge? Like, Job, I've served you every morning. Why'd you, why'd you take everything? And then why'd you send me friends as comforters they're just criticizing me god where where are you and gideon here god i'm in this to to the end just 300 and god said no this is to show that you israelites have a pride problem obviously said that, that pride so that like he said in verse two um 
lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand hath saved me. Well, God has definitely fixed that. <laughs> I don't know, what's the stat? That for every one Israelite, what's 120,000 divided by 300? For every Israelite, there's about 5,000 Midianites or something like that. Maybe a little less. Maybe it was just 1,000 for every, no, 500. It doesn't really matter. If it's just one to every 500, I mean, even David's mighty men would have had a tough time with that one. <laughs> and those guys were something else. God gave him challenges. But God also gave him, just one verse, confirmation. He called him, Gideon, follow me. But Lord, where are you at? No, I want you to follow me. Okay, I'll make a choice. I'll throw it on the altar. Challenges. Lord, we got 32,000, 22,300. Yeah, this is going to be tough. It's going to be real tough. On top of that, we don't really have any swords. Didn't think of that one. Uh, <laughs> how are we supposed to kill people if we don't have anything to kill them with? <laughs> that was a minor. That's just a side note. Just a side problem. Okay, soldiers, head out. What's our guns? Go get the pitchforks. That's about all they had. So God gave him challenges, but he also gave him confirmation. God, and this is the wonderful thing about this. God was sending Gideon. He'd called him to do a suicide mission, essentially. Because eventually he's going to say, well, you're going to go once again at night. You're going to stand around him. You're going to have a pitcher. You're going to lamp. You're going to have a a torch inside there, and you're going to break the pitcher, you're going to have a lamp and a trumpet, and you're going to do, 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 say, here we are, and Gideon is with us, or something to that effect. And uh, that's what you're going to do. That's the plan? Yep, that's the plan. He did that. But before he did that, God gave him confirmation. Verse 15. He went down, listened to the camp. God said, go down here, once again, at night. Gideon loved the night. Judges 7, 15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, there was a guy that had a dream, and he heard him, and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. God had given a dream to the Midianites that Gideon was going to come and destroy them. That was the dream that God had given to the army down there. And Gideon got to hear that was their dream. And Gideon had confirmation. God didn't leave him just out there 100% completely to try. To dry. He said, listen, I'm on your side. I know this is crazy, but this is what I want you to do. And when God, God may call you to do something, you're thinking, me, go there to these people. It doesn't make sense. Like I said this morning, I'm, I'm not a roller coaster emotional type of person. That's not generally who I am. I'm in a culture with the people that are openly or overly expressive, that like to show their emotions, sometimes wear it on their church sleeve, that are up and down, that in one moment can do, do a lot of things, and the next moment they disappear from the work of God because they're sad. If you saw their economy, you might be the same way too. <laughs> but God is, and they, they get frustrated with me because they don't understand me sometimes. They don't understand, well, why don't you get excited when we're excited? Because I don't get that sad when you're sad either. I kind of, I don't run that way. But so it's, it's difficult, and my wife is trying to, you need to be more expressive. You need to show more love. You need to show that you care. You need to give those words. They need to hear that in their culture. That's how they operate. And I'm thinking, boy, my grandpa never said I love you to my dad ever, <laughs> as far as I know. And they're just, you grow up in the farm, you work, how do you say I love you? Good job on feeding the cows. That was about as close as you ever got. That was, that was about as far as it went. So going to a place where you have to say, oh, that, that's wonderful. Oh, que bonito es el hijo que tenés. You have to, how beautiful is your son? I'm not used to being overly expressive. I've really tried at times. From preaching, you might think, oh, he might be. But on a personal level, uh, not so much. <laughs> but God will call you. You have to make a choice. And God may put you in a place where you'd think, why me in this place at this time with these challenges? But God will give you confirmation on the way as he did to Gideon. He gave him that confirmation. He gave him that. And at the end, if you follow as Gideon followed, if we as a people follow as God has called us to do, we will see changed people. And that's the last point I have. Once you go through the challenges and God gives us that confirmation, we will see people changed. We will, if we're in the work of the Lord... We're going to see folks that are going to come to him and be saved and be baptized and grow and leave their addictions and leave their evil vices to come and serve God and do what he has them to do and then raise their children correctly. And what a blessing to see that. 
It is a blessing as I've been in the ministry and I've seen people slowly but surely leave a bad path to start following on a good path. I've seen people leave sin to start following the Lord on their own. And in the story of Gideon, when he did go out and they did do that crazy strategy of blowing trumpets and showing a, showing a torch, or, is that the word in, in English, torch? That's why it's, it's lamp. There we go. Amen. Once again, even though I read it, looked through it, it's still stuck in my head in a different language. But anyway, but when God told them to do that, and they did that, and the Midianites split, and they killed themselves. And then they followed, and they won. They got a victory for the Lord. And afterwards, there was a changed nation, a free nation, a nation that could once again serve God, a nation that could once again not have the fear of having their crops taken away once a year. And if we follow the call of God, we make that choice, and we go through the challenges that are along the way, God will confirm us and help us, and we will see a changed people. I have the last verses, Judges 8.28. It says here, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. There was a... There was more to get there, obviously. Didn't read the entire story. But when we follow God, we will see people come to know the Lord, and there will be quietness in their life. A life that was lived in frustration can now be loved and vi- lived in victory for the Lord. And maybe that has happened to some of you here. Look where God has brought you from. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago, instead of being in church on a Sunday night, you were probably sitting down watching preseason football with a pack of Miller Lite in the, in the living room. How do you say that? that well, that's where a lot of people are today. I'm not, I'm not it's just the gas station the other day, and there's somebody going out, going to watch the Packers preseason game with a thing of beer, going to sit there alone and watch a game by himself. There's a lot of people like that. They, they don't have hope. They don't know what hope looks like. They don't know what Christ looks like. And some of us were like that, just as Paul said. And so were some of you. But Christ. But Christ. Amen. And that's what following God can do. If we follow God, we listen to his call, we choose to follow him. We say, I'm going to go through those challenges and the Lord's going to help me along the way. My life will be changed and along the way. As the Lord helps us, we can change other folks. Once again, like Pastor's been talking about, he talked about it at the jail the other day. It's about choices. What are you? And that's any preaching. What are we going to choose? Maybe somebody here tonight, God is touching your heart to choose to do something different than what you're supposed to do. You're going to follow that? It's going to be tough? (laughs) Well, there's blessings and there's hardships. Let's be truthful and honest. But the blessings far outweigh them. Following God, what it can do? Give you victory. Give victory to others. You'll see people change people's lives, put and set straight. And God can use you to do that. Will you allow God to do that through you? Or will you stay hiding in the wine press saying, not for me. Let somebody else have the victory. Or will you be the one to step up and say, I want to be that person. I want to be that one that gets the victory. Do crazy things that God has let me do along the way. But I'll follow. I'll be that person. I'll be that man. I'll be that woman. I'll be that teenager. I'll be that child. I want to see what following God can do. And that's the choice you have tonight. Will you follow God and allow him to do through you what could only be explained by him? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, thank you for the example of Gideon. God help us tonight. There may only be one person that this message really applies to tonight. I, I don't know, Lord. It's, it is your word. It is your message. But help us all to follow what you'd have us to do. And if we do, the things you can do through us on us, inexplicable. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this time and the invitation, bless this time as folks make decisions, maybe just one person, two people, make a choice tonight. And that choice could change many things. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for those that have come to listen tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for your love to us. And I pray, Lord, amen.